Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever state, whatever city, whatever country that you are in currently right now. My name is Shofu Babalati of Los, and you are listening to your number one online radio station. The light you need, the light you need exactly right here, right now on Inside Radio. My name remains Shofu Babalola, and this is the Best Experience Show. Okay, welcome, 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 welcome. I, I really just really love it when I'm on the show with the Pest Experience Show because we have amazing stuff, amazing guests to educate us here and also increase the awareness in the pest control industry across different sectors, across different countries, across different states, across different cities. All right, yeah, on the Pest Experience Show. And today, I mean, if you haven't seen the designs, it's a lot of work. Today, we have an amazing guest in our midst, Mr. Holly Christian, all the way from California, the owner of the Pest Posse Academy. Thank you very much for joining on this show today on the Pest Experience Show. Right, yeah. Welcome. As I always say, so, the Pest so Posse good. is live and in the house. And I'm not just live and in the house. Uh, I'm live in the house on Insights Radio. How crazy awesome is that? Super <laughs> grateful to be here. Thank you, Show, so, so, so for nice. allowing me to be um, one of your great hosts. I mean, when you, I remember when you asked me to be on the show, it's like, why would you want me? You've got all these great speakers <laughs> and these like people who have all this knowledge, and then you want me on the show. <laughs> So I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! You know the main reason why you are actually on this show is that um, you have a vast knowledge when it comes to the pest control industry. I mean, I've been following you for over like five years now, or even four years. You know, I've been learning the process, attended your courses, and this is also like an opportunity to really, really appreciate uh, the Pest Posse Academy because I was given a free scholarship, right? About four years ago, or I think three years ago, I was given a scholarship to your own academy to study for 12 weeks, in which I got a lot of certification. And that is actually where my pest control journey started from. To be honest, I this is an opportunity to say thank you very much. And it's a privilege to you joining on the show today. So quick one, without further ado, let's go straight down to the topic of discussion today. So we would be discussing about um, IPM and APM, APM, Assessment Based Pest Management. All right, that's the new industry. That's a new word. What can you say about that, sir? Well, you know, the reality is, is this is a, we're going to kind of talk about the differences between these two, um, but this is what we would like to see as the new standard for urban slash structural pest management. And one of the main reasons for that is, IPM was designed for agriculture. It was not designed for urban pest management. Um, it doesn't make it bad. Um, it doesn't make it wrong if you use it. It's just APM gives you some specific tweaks that I think will help us get our jobs done better. Um, mm. Let's move on to the next slide. Just for those of you who don't know who the Pest Posse is. I am a partner with Foster Brushka. Um, we founded the Pest Posse back in 2017. And between the two of us, we have over 50 years experience in pest management. Wow. Um, we do provide timely and hopefully accurate training and information that is needed to be that you need to be successful. And we do that through three ways. One, we do that through Pest Posse TV. Now, for any of you who have not heard of Pest Posse TV, Pest Posse TV is free. It's a free subscription on our website. You just go to pestpossetv.com. Just search that. You find it. It comes up. You put in your email. We'll give you a, um, a password. And um, you have access 
to all of our content. Now, with that said, it does work a little better on a laptop computer than it does on a phone. We are working on that. We know it's a problem and we are working on that. Uh, we Fantastic. also have what we call, oh, stay back there, Pest Posse Academy, which is what Shofu highlighted. What I like to let people yeah. know is when I started in pest control back in 1995, um, I got, I literally was taken to two jobs. My boss took me to two jobs to train me. We did both of them illegally. And then he took me back to the office. He gave me a stack of work orders and he said, get to work. That was it. I had to figure everything else out from there. So as you can imagine, I made lots of mistakes. And um, back in 2017, we decided we wanted to create a training program that was video based, um, not just PowerPoint, not just reading a book, but it's literally video based. So I do the work, we talk about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and um, we actually show you what it looks like. So that's Pest Posse Academy. And then we have Pest Posse, just us. We do consulting, we do other things, try to help you out. Give us a call anytime you want, and we'll answer questions. Um, typically, Foster's answering the phone. He is Captain Productivity, and uh, he will get <laughs> things done that need to be done. So he couldn't be with us today because this is his day off, and I wanted him to spend time with his family. All right, so let's yeah. get into the topic. Enough about me. Um, so I, I really think it's important to give credit where credit is due. Assessment-based pest management was not invented by the pest posse. OK, this was this terminology, this idea was brought into fruition by Dr. Deanie Miller, a professor of urban pest management um, in, at Virginia Tech. OK, so she knows her stuff a whole lot better than I do. And she did not like some of the issues that were being created by what we call IPM. So let's move forward. Want to just want to give her credit because she is the one who came up with this. Now, let's talk a little bit about integrated pest management. Let's talk about the history of integrated pest management. Okay, mm. go ahead and move forward. So IPM grew out of the discontent of using purely insecticidal um, control measures. This was back in the 50s. World War II was over. We... Um, we found DDT was a fabulous product in the sense that it pretty much killed everything um, in regards to insects. They would literally just douse the fields with um, DDT and other products. And they found that we were having other issues because of the fact that DDT is also toxic, you know, to mammals yeah. and to uh, birds and different things. So we won't go into that specifically, but um, what they did is they adopted this method by which they would measure how many pests were in the fields. And if they could get away with not treating the fields and still make a profit. So this was all designed for money purposes. This was not designed to save the planet. Okay. This was designed to save the farmers money, which I don't have a problem with. I think that's fantastic. And I hope they continue to use, um, <laughs> you know, this out in the crop fields, you know, because I want our farmers True. to make money because we need food. Right. Um, True. But we adopted it for urban pest control. And um, but we tend to use it very loosely. OK, hmm. and that's where the, the real issues come in. So let's move to the next slide. So what is the definition? This is actually um, from the University of California's statewide IPM program. Now, California's biggest, um, their biggest industry may not be crops anymore, but it used to be agriculture. Uh, it might be computers now. Because uh, as most people know, Silicon Valley is in is in California, but it's still one of the top industries in the in the state. 
And so um, the state of California's university system is big in IPM. It's big in uh, crop management and learning about that. So IPM is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification yeah. of cultural practices, and the use of resistant varieties. So that would be like um, plants, right? We're talking about crops. So they put in the sure. plant resistant varieties of a certain type of, say, basil, right? Um, they're having a problem with a certain bug but there's a certain species of basil that that bug is not very good with. And so they'll plant that type instead. Um, pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates that they are needed according to established guidelines and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. Okay. So here's one of the big, big issues between IPM and APM. I rarely, if ever, go to a home or a restaurant and they say, we can live with a few bed bugs or we can live with a few rats. How often do you hear that? Do you ever hear that, Chofu? Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah. Um, I I rarely, if ever, I mean, I you'll never hear that about bed bugs, right? How many times cool. does somebody say, well, we can live with a couple of bed bugs? Right, they just want to just want to get rid of them. They don't. They don't yeah, want to get this story all, or anything. Right, exactly. Yeah, so this is scary a, this of them is for a, me. You know, yeah, there is no threshold in urban exactly. pest management. Right, there's no threshold. But this is an important feature of IPM and crops. I'll try to okay, eat. so this yeah. is one of the areas that tends to um, this system tends to fall down a little bit. Um, Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to humans' health, uh, beneficial and non-target organisms in the environment, which, of course, we all hopefully are trying to do anyway. All right, let's move on to the next slide. I'm probably going to skip a couple of these because we don't want to spend yeah. all kinds of time on this. Um, okay, I so can let's probably... go down to assessment. <laughs> so right. the biggest thing is, two biggest things about IPM – is one, it was created to save money, okay? So people don't realize that. That's a big big thing to uh, realize. Two, if I can get my hand in the screen, two is threshold. There typically is no threshold in urban pest management. So let's talk mm. about assessment-based pest management. Dini Miller came up with this idea. One of the things that she was finding was she was going out to – multi-unit housing um, and people were charging like five bucks a door, right? Well, how long does it take you to service one apartment unit correctly? Can you really do it in, in for $5, right? She also mm. figured out it takes True. 40 seconds to knock on the door and wait for somebody to let you in on average. It's 40 seconds just to get in the door and you haven't even done any work yet. But for $5, hmm. you had to do the whole job, which only gives you maybe four to five minutes to do the job, at least in the United States, right? Where our economy yeah. is much different than other parts of the world. Um, so that was one of the issues she found. There was no... You know, even IPM talks about monitoring, right? Figuring out how many pests we have, what kind of damage they're doing. Well, yes. um, none of that was happening. So let's move on. So assessment-based pest management. The biggest thing about assessment-based pest management is just that, assessment. Hmm. So one of the things I teach people, one of the reasons I got good at my job is because I did just that. I didn't know I was doing it, but I was doing it. I would go out to a job. I would do a treatment. And of course, I didn't know what I was doing. So the next time I went back to the job, I would assess how well I did. 
how many spider webs are left on the home? Are there still rats? Are there still mice? Are there still ants? I mean, was I getting control? What did I do? Do I need to do anything different? Um, I call this a system of, I learned this from a leadership organization I was involved with, plan, do, check, and adjust. So you plan what plan, you're going to do. do, check, do, and, adjust. and adjust. So you plan what you're going to do. You do your plan. Then you check your plan. Then you adjust accordingly. I, I did that naturally. Mm. I just did it and it, it worked out. Now, this is kind of what we're talking about with assessment-based pest management. Because the first thing you have to do is assess the situation. Okay. Now, um, let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so, the principles of assessment-based pest management. You're going to start with your initial assessment, which is going to be one, doing your inspection, right? That's the first thing you're going to have yeah. to do is your inspection. Then you're going to want to put monitors out. Notice we didn't talk about any treatment yet. No treatment. You put your monitors exactly. out first. Okay. Then you follow up, and we're probably going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but um, then you set up guidelines. What kind of management is needed? Not guidelines for when management is needed, but what kind. Hmm of management is needed, right? That may be nothing, that may be exclusion, right? We're gonna use a combination of biological, yes. control, cultural, physical, mechanical, chemical um, management tools. Um, you know, these are all the different things. We'll go into a little bit more detail later about what those are. And then after the action is taken, you're going to assess the effect of your pest management and perform any necessary follow-ups. In other words, you're gonna check and you're gonna change your plan accordingly if that's what you need to do. Hmm. All right, so let's move forward. It's very similar, but it's a little bit of a tweak in your thinking. So Exactly, just a little bit um, of assessment first. Right, so if you do apartments, uh, even if you do residential, you're gonna walk in and see this a lot, right? This happens fairly regularly. You show up on people they weren't prepared. And a lot of times you'll see this. Um, True. <laughs> the, I this still saw this yesterday. Is, <laughs> right. These, th this is, um, you know, the, these methods work extremely well for German cockroach control, bed bug infestations, uh, multi-unit housing developments. They work great for residential. Um, keep in mind this whole process is uh, all about preventing um, preventing pests in the long run, right? Exactly. So you've got your monitoring, you've got your corrective sanitation issues. Now, here's the thing we brought up a little bit earlier. We were talking about this pre-show. How many times do they clean? Hmm. How many customers, when you tell them this needs to be clean, you come back and they cleaned it, right? Nah, for me, maybe 5% of the time. Maybe, you know, the other 95% of the time I come back and it looks like this again. The same right? thing. <laughs> True. Okay. I think so, it has to do like the behavioral pattern. Mm -hmm. The behavioral pattern of each of the customers. Yeah. I mean, some people are clean. Some people are messy. It's just part of their personality makeup. There could be a lot of reasons exactly. for that. We're not psychologists. We're not going to figure it out. We're just going to have to deal with it. Um, in my opinion, as a professional and doing business for tw being in the industry and still doing services today, um, if this is if you're telling your customers you can't get control because of the sanitation, you're you're that's your problem. That's not theirs. Exactly. Um, you can get control. You just are not willing to do the work it takes to get control. Now, if that account was bid improperly based upon the sanitations um that's another issue because it is going to cost more more money to get control in a situation like this and so you're going to need to charge more money in those situations it's just part of what happens you're going to have to make more visits you're going to have to use more product i mean i i went yeah. into a um i went into a hoarding situation a few months a year or so ago and um the guy had had his dogs removed. The state removed his dogs because it was an unsafe living environment. He wanted his dogs back, but he refused to clean his house. 
I wow. went in and I put out, I put out 80 or 90 snap traps in a 25, 2800 square foot home. Okay. Wow. So guess what? I caught over a hundred mice and I got control and nothing ever was cleaned until after I got control. In fact, I told them don't clean until I get control mm -hmm. because That's all true. that would happen is the mice would run everywhere into the neighbor's yards and yeah. they could spread disease, right? Cause they could have, they could mm -hmm. be carrying disease. So I didn't want them, you know, to clean up. Um, but I knew how to take care of the situation by assessment. Without, yes, because mm -hmm. I assessed the situation. I, I got experience as well. And I have a principle for rodent control that, um, I used to teach all the time when I ran several companies. And that is you could always put too few traps out for a rodent control job, but you can never put too many traps out. Hmm. You understand? You can always put too few traps, but you can't put many. Yeah, you can't put too many, right? Because you don't know how many rodents are there unless you set cameras out and you can count and everything. Uh, which exactly. is part of assessment and monitoring. And that's not a bad um, way to do it. That's a very good way to do it. In fact, I have a friend who does that. He'll go in with cameras first. Cameras. And he'll assess. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, here's yes. mine right here. It's a little camera. Okay. okay. This is a, a fairly inexpensive model on Amazon, but I've used this on a number of, uh, a number of occasions. I set this out to see if I still had rodent activity or if I had it at all, I had a customer one time who was telling me, uh, she kept hearing noises and all this. I couldn't catch anything. I put this out. Guess what? We solved the problem because there wasn't anything. She was, <coughs> excuse me. She was having, I don't know what was going on, but whatever she was hearing was not a rodent because we could never see anything in this camera. So there's all kinds of ways to perform your assessment. Okay. Um, but that this you know this is a good method for rodents but you want to monitor okay um exactly if you if you can get the sanitation done great because i had one restaurant where um we could never i wasn't i was still early in the in my career i would get control and then we'd have roaches again i would get control then we'd have roaches again and then we got mm. a new manager and she made them clean everything Guess what? I didn't have any more cockroaches ever. So it's not like sanitation is bad. It's really good, but yeah. you can't use it as an excuse because as you're really excuse. not. A it's just an added advantage. Exactly. Um, so physical and mechanical controls. What are those? Those are things like vacuums, steam for bed yeah. bugs, um, heat treatments, um, mechanical traps, snap traps. Uh, monitors, glue boards, you know, all kinds of things fit into that, right? Um, and then start off when you actually get to the point where you're going to do a treatment, start off with re with performing reduced exposure treatments. Now, with hmm. cockroaches, what that means, IGRs and baits, right? Uh, insect growth regulators and baits. We have plenty of great baits on the product. You add those with the IGRs and you, th it's difficult not to get control if you're doing it right. Okay. Um, follow True. the manufacturer's guidelines. I always remind people, do you know how much it, it costs to get a product to market? Hmm. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot it's of work. It's over a hundred thousand dollars to bring a product to market. Wow. Your average product hmm. costs a, a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars to get it to market. Would they put a product out that didn't work according to their according to their directions? Just to get it to, hmm. they're not going to put it out. Here's why: because if the product doesn't work, they're not going to make their money back. Exactly. Right? Exactly. It's a bad investment. People are in business to make money. That's just the reality. But if they put out a bad product, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to use it because it doesn't work. If it doesn't work according to their directions, same thing, right? Um, 
if they exactly. put out directions that don't, you know, the label doesn't actually work. The product doesn't work according to the label. Again, they don't make any money. So it behooves them to make sure that their label is, is going to, you know, if you use the product according to the label, it's going to work correctly and it's going to get control. So is every product right for every situation? Absolutely not. Okay, sure. so you got to get to know the products that work right for your your microclimate, right? What works here in California may not work good in Nigeria. True, that's a fact. Okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I learned that when I first started the pest policy, and I was doing all the social media, and I was talking to all these people around the United States. And a product that I loved and worked all the time, they'd be like, "Oh, that product sucks," and I was like, uh, "You probably just aren't using it right." Well, then they're like, oh, I love this product. This product works every time. It's like a silver bullet. And I was like, that product doesn't work at all in my area. And then I was like, bing, the light bulb went on. Why would this guy lie? <laughs> he wouldn't, right? They're not going to lie. They're just wow. telling their thoughts the way they see it. So why does it work for me and not for mm. them? I don't really know, but keep that in mind that, a product that might work in one area isn't necessarily going to work good in another area. So um, it's always important for you to get to know what products work best in your area, in your microclimate. You know, there's some products I might use up in the hills, but I'm not going to use them down by the beach, you know, or something like that. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. So let's move on to the next slide. As you know, and can tell, I love to talk. <laughs> It's not that I love to hear the sound of my own voice. I just like to talk. Um, all right, next slide. <laughs> I was going right. to ask a particular question. You know, I, yes, I think sir. I think it has to do with this also. I inspected mm -hmm. a facility. You know, this is best experience. And um, mm -hmm. if you're listening to me right now, the chat box is open on YouTube. You can drop in your comments if you have questions so far with the discussions that we have been making. Uh, concerning assessment, monitoring, and how easily can you do assessment and how can you get the customer to collaborate with you? I think that's a question I'm expecting someone to ask in the chat box. If you are listening also on the radio station, insightradio.net, there is a chat box there, just sign in with your name. And I would be reading out your questions directly to Mr. Coley, all the way from California. And um, I want to ask a question. I inspected a facility yesterday, and um, it's supposed to be a bed book treatment, but the room is extremely scattered. I mean, the clothes is upside down, the wardrobes are scattered, and everything is just... How do you deal with bed bugs in that kind of situation? If I'm going to do assessment-based pest management in that kind of situation, what's going to be the process like? How would the communication with the client, how will it be like? You know, to get... Because to achieve this thing effectively collaborations and cooperation with the clients is really, really important. The clients need to collaborate with you to be able to achieve the goal. So how do you do that? How would you recommend that? Let's go through the slide first, and then I will answer that question. How's that? Okay, okay? fantastic. So yes, inspection, okay? So first, use a yes. good quality flashlight with high lumens. I typically use a mag light, a little stream light, um, with like, uh, I think it's like 3000 lumens. Um, the reason I use that flashlight and I pay $150 for those flashlights, it's not cheap, wow. but let me tell you something. That flashlight is so bright. It will flush cockroaches out of hiding spots. It will completely <laughs> change your pest control perspective. Okay. This is, so if you, if you can't get one of those, no problem, but you want as high a lumens as you can get. Okay. It's really important. All right. Um, uh, you want to be able to obviously, uh, monitor, um, wait, go back. We're still talking inspection. All right. Um, you want to be able to identify the pest activity, the potential pest harborages. You're looking for those kind of areas as well. You don't want them to just move from one, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. You don't want them to move to, from one spot to another because you could, you treat the area they're in, they're just going to move to the area you didn't treat, right? So you want to make sure that you yes. know where all the potential areas are so you can treat those. Um, so focus, focusing on the pest vulnerable areas where food and water are present, okay? All pests need what? They need food, water, and water harborage. And shelter. 
and shelter, right? Fantastic. You take away yes. any one of those, okay? You don't have to take away all of them, just one, and your pest problem will go away, okay? Super important, all right? Uh, focus on inspecting equipment where he, and where heat is generated. A lot of pests love heat, right? Um, look yes. for unsealed openings such as missing or loose pipes, conduit, escutcheon plates. You know where a pipe goes into the wall, there's a little plate that goes in front of it. That's an escutcheon plate. Um, edges around sinks and cabinets. And you want to document your inspection findings. This is super, super important. And the more we move forward, um, the more this is going to be important for everybody. And the reason is, is this will cover you legally. Uh, as well as it's a great way to communicate with your client. Um, so this is a super important. At the Pest Posse, we always say if it wasn't documented, it did not happen. So it's super important. Now, with all that said, let's go back to Shofu's question. You're doing a okay. bed bug inspection. It doesn't really matter what yes. you're doing. Whether You could be doing bed bugs, rodents, cockroaches, fleas, doesn't matter. You walk in and the house is a shambles, right? Um, kind of like that picture we showed earlier, the kitchen. It's got stuff all over. Well, you got clothes all over. Well, so one of the first things I would say is if you're not reading books, you should be reading books. Start reading good books, good professional books. First book I recommend people read all the time is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And the reason yeah. I tell people to read that book is because it will help you learn how to deal with people so that you can walk into a situation like that. You can have a difficult conversation because you are going to have to have a difficult conversation because you're going to either have to let them know they either have to clean up or you won't do the service, which is something I will gladly do. I'll walk in and be like, yeah, I can't help you until you clean this up. And, Ooh, I will, and I'm will. i like, you can call somebody else. It's up to you. But I guarantee you that if you don't clean this up, you know, I won't be able, especially with bed bugs is a little different. I mean, I can go into a cockroach situation and I can handle that or rodents. Bed bugs, you got to even be able to treat, right? If you got clothes exactly. on over, you, you can't treat the clothes, <laughs> right? <laughs> Exactly. So, um, you've got to have that difficult conversation. Everybody's personality is a little different. You've got to read your client. You've got to approach the subject gently, but firmly. You know, I've had those difficult conversations. I'm like, okay, either I have to go through your stuff to do this inspection, or you have to pick it up before I do the inspection. So I can come back tomorrow or the next day or whatever and reschedule. Um, or I can just, you know, because here's the thing. You're doing bed bugs. Um, to do a proper bed bug infestation, you got to rip off the bottom of that. Well, depending upon the bedding, right? In the United States, most places have mattresses and box springs. Well, the box spring has that cover on the bottom. You've got to rip that off. You, have, you basically have no choice but to rip that off so that you can look in there and see if there's any bed bug activity, right? Uh, if you're not doing that, you're not doing a proper inspection. So there's certain things that you, and conversations you're going to have to have that are tough because like I had one customer, we had, um, we had um, carpet beetles. That's what it was. We had carpet beetles. And I talked to a buddy of mine. I'd never had a carpet beetle problem like this. Usually carpet beetles in California is super simple. You treat the baseboards, carpet beetle problem goes away. Real easy. Most of them are coming from outside. And it's usually just kind of an occasional thing where you get carpet beetles in the house. Well, I kept treat. I treated the baseboards a couple of times. I couldn't figure out where. They, I checked everything. I couldn't find anything. And I called a friend of mine who'd been in the business longer than I had. And he said, you've got to, he says, typically um, in our experience, he used to work for a big company here in California. And he said, we always check the, um, the underside of the box spring. He says, they'll get up in there. And that's typically where they're at because carpet wow. beetles feed on, um, they're domestic. So they feed on clothes, you know, like wool, cotton, yes. you know, um, 
Well, I talked to the customer. I told him I needed to tear that off. And they were like, absolutely not. That's un that's unthinkable. I'm like, <laughs> when do you ever see the bottom of your box spring? I'm like, I have a stapler. <laughs> I can staple it back on. Oh, no, absolutely oh not. God. That was not going to happen. I was like, you, and then, you know, you're in the situation where you're like, well, I can't guarantee if I'm going to get control or not. You know, I need to get in there, you know? Wow. So, um, so there's certain things you have to be able to do and you have to have those difficult conversations. And I encourage you, uh, every be willing to walk away. I can't stress that enough. When you have that mm. mentality in your mind, that will overcome more issues than you could possibly imagine. When the customer knows that you'll walk away from the money if they're unwilling to do what you need them to do, that can change a situation. Not everybody's willing to take the time to go and find another pest control company. Okay. Now, we're all in business to make money. So, um, you know, we don't want to leave and walk away from a job. Believe me, I get that. But one thing I was telling Shofu earlier is, I have never regretted any job I ever walked away from. And I've walked away from a lot of jobs. True. But I have regretted a lot of times staying on a job that I should have walked away from. And um, part work. of the reason of me being in my own business is to have less stress and have an easier life. And when I do those jobs that I knew I should have walked away from, I'm just putting myself in the situation of all that stress and all of that. So, um, so I just encourage yeah. people be willing to, but you got to learn, right? You can't walk away from every job or you never make any money. All right. So let's move on. Exactly. We're going to be running out of time. Final go faster. <laughs> all right. I'm so sure here's we have a couple of people thing. questions and all. So we'll take that right. after the, right. after the class. Yeah. No problem. All right. So, um, now, you've done your inspection. Now you want to start putting in monitors. I really like plastic monitors. You can see in this picture, I prefer the plastic monitors. If you can't afford plastic monitors, then obviously the, the paper glue board ones will do. But what I hate about those paper glue board monitors is typically, especially restaurants, I'll come back and they're gone, right? They've cleaned them up. They've hosed them down. They're wet and soggy. They're, they just aren't very functional. So I've, I've moved on to using these plastic monitors, but it doesn't really matter. There's various monitors for, for um, insect control. You can have multi-catch traps for rodent, for mice. You've got um, the, um, the little traps that go under the legs of the bed for bed bugs. There's all kinds of different monitors. You should have access to all of those depending upon the type of work you do. Now, you're gonna date the monitors. You're going to put the monitors out and then you're going to come back in a couple of days. Okay. And you're going to check those monitors. So like a lot of times I'll put them out on a Friday and then I come back on Monday and I see what I catch. Okay. This is super important to make this extra visit. Um, again, this goes back to how you're going to price your job in the first place. That's something I wanted to come, I'm coming into that. like, because in, in a Nigerian system, I really don't think, in fact, when it comes to bed bugs, I mean, I do a lot of bed bug jobs and that's like almost like 99% of the jobs that I handle. And mm -hmm. um, it's quite important that if I'm going for any bed bug job, there's always a follow-up treatment, you know. And sometimes most of the clients are always like, follow up, why? How? Just come and get this, get rid of these things for me once and for all. Right. You know, I, I walk out of those kind of jobs. They think your product is the magic pill. Exactly, right? exactly. Not, That's the it's, point. They think it's the product, <laughs> and it's not the product, it's you, it's, the, it's your exactly. knowledge. That's why you have insight radio, right? That's why we're here talking yes. <laughs> because it's not about the product so much as it is about what your knowledge allows you to do. You are exactly. a professional, just like an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, I mean a cabinet maker. A tile, you're you are a professional. You have to know hundreds of insects, how they live, where they harbor, and how exactly. to treat them without <laughs> hurting the people they're living in the environment, right? Well, if you don't. 
<laughs> so it, and they're not exactly. going to know that until you have that mentality yourself. And so part of the sales process is educating them. You know, like when I'm training a guy in the field, I'm letting them know it's not just what you treat with, it's where you treat with it, right? You could go into a bed bug job and you could not get any control because you didn't treat the right areas, right? Um, but if you treat true, the right areas, <laughs> you're going to get control, but you have to know that you have to have yes, that knowledge. Yeah. So super important. I mean, I to know um, yeah, I doubt. <laughs> that was one of the things Dini Miller would, would talk about all the time is, is when she's talking to these clients, you know, she's talking to the managers and the, and the, um, uh, you know, the janitorial staff and all that. She, and they're, they're like, well, you know, all you need to do is go in and treat and she's all treat with what? Diet Coke, you know, well, what treat with what, you know, it could be diet Coke. How do you know? Right. If you're not paying attention to those details, it's again, the point of that is, is to say, it's not about what you're treating with. It's about how you're doing the job. So super important on that note, let's get back to the slide and move forward. All right, so you're going to want to date. You're going to want to number how many pests are in the monitor, okay? I always encourage people to take pictures of the monitor, all right, um, so that you can track it. A picture, like I say, is worth a 1,000 words, you know? Take pictures. You can literally show somebody with a picture. Here's what, what it was like when we started, and then when you reassess, take another picture, and you can say, see, here's what it's like when we were finished, so you can see a clean monitor, or maybe you see a, a monitor with much fewer insects on it. Very important. Go back to um, uh, the monitor page. I'm going to make sure. We probably covered it good enough. So there was a follow-up two or three days later. Now, once you've figured out what pests you have, and then you can decide on how you're going to treat. So, let's, yeah, let's move forward. Um, so you want to start off, okay, was that it? Is that the next one? Or do we go to yes, assessment? assessment? Okay. So determine what yes. needs to be improved. Okay. Sanitation. Once again, you're going to make the recommendations. Okay. But you can't control whether or not they do those recommendations. Okay. So now we're going to move into control measures. So we're going to start off with uh, the next slide. All right. Physical and mechanical control measures. So um, you're going to need to start what needs to be repaired, right? Especially if you're dealing with rodents, you, you really need to figure out how they're getting in, how you're going to make repairs, um, to keep them out. Okay. Do you need to install door sweeps to keep insects out or rodents? Um, is there landscaping that needs to be cut back from the structure? Um, should dumps dumpsters be moved away from the buildings? Are the lids secured? Do they fit correctly? Um, are they closed or open all the time? I mean, all of these things you got to figure out on the physical and mechanical controls. Are you going to start off performing a steam treatment? What's the next, what's the next slide? Um, all right. Yeah. Mechanical. Okay. So here we go. So I always recommend starting off with a HEPA vac. Okay. This is really, really great way to get massive insects removed quickly with no chemical application at all. Uh, when I do my cockroach cleanouts, um, bed bug cleanouts, I start off with a vacuum. That's my first step. Okay. This is a great way to, um, to start your control measures. All right. Um, using a non chemical flushing agent. There's lots of them out there. There's good um, uh, essential oil. Flushing agents, essential oils are very repellent, so you can use those to flush. Also, are you familiar with Central. canned air? Okay, have you ever used canned air, like to clean out your computer keyboard? No, no, you know, little no. Little cans of air, you ever see those? So we have those a lot in the United States. It's just a little can of compressed wow. air. And you can actually flush cockroaches with that. You spray that up wow. in the cracks and crevices, and it'll flush the cock help Flushing flush agents. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no chemical. It's just CO2, you know, it's compressed CO2. So um, that's a good non 
chemical flushing agent. Uh, use mechanical traps, that snap traps for rodents. You're going to use glue boards or you're going to use um, the, you know, the bed bug monitors that you put under the legs of the bed, all that different kind of stuff. All of that can help you. Of course, more glue boards for cockroaches. All of that can help you um, with mechanical control measures. All right, next slide. Uh, also, steam. Um, so you could also use steam as a great bed bug uh, method. Uh, that's good for that's like the theme. mattress. <laughs> yeah, it's super great way to do treatments without chemical. All right. So when you're starting with and you're thinking of reduced exposure treatments, typically we're thinking of cockroaches because we're going to talk about baits and insect growth regulators. Now, Bait, let's say you're dealing with, like we deal with mites sometimes, biting mites, like rodent mites, um, chiggers, uh, bird mites. Well, there are no baits or IGRs for those, right? So you can't use that as a treatment. Now, there's lots of other great treatments, but you need to know, once again, back to our topic of learning, you need to know what reduced measures you can use for those pests, okay? Um Use only material, use materials only when presence of pests, there's a pest issue. I've done restaurants, it's absolutely hilarious. I've done restaurants, typically my restaurant treatment is inspection, monitoring, and I treat only if there is an active infestation. I do not treat otherwise. Um, I remember one time I was in a restaurant that I, that I serviced and we were having a couple of beers and something to eat. And the guy comes out and he's like, oh, I could tell you were here the other day. He said, he said, I saw a cockroach come out and die on the floor. <laughs> and uh, I said, great, glad to hear it. So then I leaned over to my buddy and I was like, I haven't treated this place for three months. <laughs> because there wasn't ever any cockroaches when I was there. Wow. My monitors were all clean. There were no roaches on my monitors. You know, I had done my inspection, checked the hot spots where there's usually cockroaches, nothing. So what happened? We probably had a stray cockroach, got in, ate some of my bait, and then went and died. Exactly. You know, where he could see it. Because the bait lasts a long time. A it long time, yeah. I, I've literally had uh, – now, when it's fresh and it's soft, it's more palatable. But will they mm. eat it later? Absolutely. I've had, I've had roaches eat my bait as long as a year later and die wow wow so that can happen is that normal probably not you are you gonna be able to control exactly. you know a bad infestation like i had a i had an apartment complex where um i couldn't get control in one unit and i was trying to figure out why can i not get control in this one unit i found out the lady in the unit works at a restaurant that has cockroaches so she was going to work and bringing cockroaches bring back. back home Wow. I was getting control, but she kept reintroducing the cockroaches. Bring it back. Hmm. <clears throat> so what do you, you know, you've got to, your only choice in that situation is either to go get that restaurant on service or exactly. educate her on, you know, don't bring your purse to work, right? Exactly. Bring as little to work as possible. Hmm. You know, don't bring a jacket in there. You know, I mean, you might be cold in the winter, but you don't, those roaches will get into that jacket and back to your house, they'll go. So um, all of that goes into monitoring, communication, communication. Um, dealing with the exactly. client, you know, um, make sure you rotate your baits. So hmm. just like when you're using your insecticides and like your guy from India was talking about rotating the, the not yeah. the active, so rotate the mode of action okay so every material works on a specific part of that insect's biology yes and you want to you want to work on different parts of that insect's biology you want to switch okay baits you're not worried about what part of the biology they're act after what you're worried about is the food so what's your favorite food chofu what do you love to eat? If you could go eat anything tonight, what would you go buy? If you, money wasn't uh, an option. <laughs> Maybe some rice. <laughs> rice? Okay. I'd have a steak, yeah. right? I'd have an expensive New York steak. Nice <laughs> inch and a half thick, two inches thick. That would be on my preference. 
Would I want to eat that steak every day? Hmm. Breakfast, lunch, dinner for no, the next three that's years? Po- that's not possible. <laughs> right? That's not possible. Okay. So cockroaches, what happens is the, the roaches that like that food eat it. Okay. Yes. And then it kills their young, right? The young eat the cock, older cockroach. They either eat the carcass or they eat the feces or they eat the bait or whatever. And then you have a few left over that don't like that flavor of bait. It's called bait aversion. We learned this back in early 2000s because all of a sudden our bait stopped working and we couldn't figure out why. It's because some of the cockroaches didn't like the taste of the bait. So you have to rotate your bait so that you don't get bait aversion. Okay. It's a totally different concept than resistance. All right. It's similar, but it's different. All right. Now, um, so you've done your uh, reduced exposure treatment. You've rotated your bait. You've done all these things. Now, what you may be faced with is you may be faced with a situation where you actually need to use um, a liquid material or you need to use dust. You would then have to, at this point, you're going to assess what needs to be done and you might choose an appropriate labeled product for that situation. But we really encourage you to use baits, IGRs, essential oils, all these reduced um, risk materials first, okay? Because one, we want to we want to keep our environment as healthy as possible. Two, um, we uh, we want to keep our customers and their pets as safe as possible, and um, we also. Now, depending upon how your individual government runs in Cal- in the United States, once a product's been used enough, they're going to take it off the market, whether it needs to be taken off the market or not, because the way they view a product is they have like this imaginary cup and then they track because we all have to turn in how much product we used every month out at our, our job sites. We have to document that and turn it into the government. And as that cup fills, they start to restrict the use of that product. So if you're using products that don't get measured that way, then you can keep that product on the market longer because you might need that product for certain circumstances. All right. Then the last thing you do is you're going to assess your whole program. You're going to go back to your monitors. You're going to do your inspections, all of that. You want to do that for at least two to six months. And actually, of course, most of us want to set these customers up on a regular recurring service where we continue to monitor, we continue to do maintenance, um, and we continue to move forward with that program because we want a regular income. But we also want to take care of our clients and make sure we're not just going in spraying and praying that the spray did the job, right? Um, So that is... Uh, more of an in-depth, deep dive into assessment-based pest management. And look at that. I, I finished five minutes early. Exactly. Fantastic. It has been a wonderful journey so far. I mean, it's so, so, so nice. I mean, you have watched uh, Professor Dini Miller, you know, how she explained and the whole history, the idea behind uh, assessment-based best management is actually a very good fantastic and a sincere strategy in getting rid of different pests you know to right. get rid of different pests right. the idea behind uh, good assessment-based best management is actually a very good fantastic and a sincere strategy it goes beyond in just applying any kind of uh pesticides in any kind of apartment but proper assessment of a What's the problem exactly? Mm -hmm. That's what assessment is all about, you know. So it has to do with you communicating with your clients. mm -hmm. Communication. At this point now, Mm -hmm. communication is like very, very, very important. Mm -hmm. So if I do, we still have Mr. Corley Christian all the way from California right here on the show with me on Inside Radio. And this is the Pest Experience Show. 
So whatever state, whatever country, whatever city that you are in right now, just drop in your questions. Okay, we have Mrs. Mitai Ire Ogugu all the way from Nigeria. That's the CEO of uh, Mitai Creations, Clean Hand Services. Thank you very much for joining. She said, glad Thanks to be here, eager yeah. to learn. Yeah. Then we have uh, Mr. George Bidoy, my very good friend, my very good friend, all the way from the New York City. You get paid for what you know and not what you apply. Thank you very That's much right, for George. the comments. I, yeah, thank you. So if you have comments, con con suggestions, and also points you want us to talk about or questions or whatever you, that you want us to talk about here, so we are still right here. I'm still checking up the chat box on Inside Radio. That uh, we still have our guests right here, and we still have about five more minutes before we round up the show. So a couple things, show food to continue to continue yeah. people's learning and knowledge on assessment-based pest management. I've got two recommendations. One is, of course, Pest Posse TV. Go to Pest Posse Fantastic. TV, get your free subscription, and you can actually watch our interview with Dr. Dini Miller. Okay, it's a great interview that we were able to do with her. Also, she was on Futura, which is out of Germany, and she also talks about assessment-based pest management on their show, and it was yeah. a fantastic show. Uh, I would encourage everybody to watch both of those if they want more knowledge on this topic because she's going to explain it much better than me. Um, and so um, take a listen I think to those. I would, um, those are both really good episodes. So we have an email list. We have an email list of uh, most of our listeners and our subscribers. So if you are not on the email list, I'm going to attach a link at the end of this video on YouTube so you can join our email list and subscribe because I will be sharing this opportunity. And um, before we got Mr. Corley on the show, he promised that um, every participant of the show tonight is going to get access to the Pest Posse TV. And um, he has actually sent me the link about two weeks ago, you know, and even mm -hmm. the video with uh, Dini, Ms. Professor Dini Miller from the Virgin uh, Tech, you know, mm -hmm. so he has sent me the link and I'm going to be dishing it out the, tomorrow, oh, that's Monday, because we... We dish mm -hmm. it out every Monday. Our newsletters are always every mm -hmm. Monday. So it's going to be okay. part of our email list tomorrow. So mm -hmm. the link, if you have your email, you know, you can just send it to us at info mm -hmm. at insideradio.net or shofubabala at gmail.com and just email me and I would uh, get them across to you. So uh, do you have anything to say again? We just have a couple of minutes, just two minutes before we round up the show. So I'd like to encourage everybody... Um, just to do what you've been do what you do, Shofu, which is learn. And actually, um, we just did a webinar uh, about um, setting up your own training program. And one of the things we covered is how people learn in that, that webinar. And one of them, we call it the learning tree. Basically, when people listen to a lecture, they only absorb about 5% of that. You know, within like 48 hours, they can only remember 5% of a lecture. Um, if they see exactly. it on video or they read it, that will increase. Okay. Um, and then if you te if you actually implement what you've learned, then it continues to increase. But the biggest thing on the list that really drives it home is if you teach it. Hmm. When you teach like you do, like you get to bring all these people on this great show from all over the world, which I am, was really impressed with. Um, Thank you. But you end up learning a lot more than you would True. if you just listened. Okay. True. So if you have the chance to uh, teach at your company, if you have the chance to go to, um, you know, some of your clients and teach your clients, uh, if you work with like uh, housing authorities, you work with uh, hotels. Um, my partner Foster used to go into the hotels and, and um, the engineering department, he used to teach them, and the janitorial he used to teach them, or housekeeping is usually what it's called, um, but he used to teach them how to identify bed bugs so they could find them faster while they're cleaning the rooms and hence get treatments done quicker and then obviously move forward. But there was a teaching um, 
opportunity for him to um, to do that. And so hence he ended up learning more about bed bugs because he actually taught it. So super, just some wow. things to think about. Limp based on um, practice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. And you will get that's, that's really, a very, really that's good, a very good way to. Fantastic. I Thank you my very, very much. Time. It's such a, to be honest, that's, that's exactly the best route. You know, thank you very much. It's super, super an honor to have you all the way from California. Join us live here in Nigeria on the show. This is a best experience show brought to you by Inside Radio. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you all stay tuned for over an hour to listen to this insightful moment. And you know, you can always check back the video and learn more, relearn, because there are a lot of things that you probably have missed during the show. So stay tuned. This is the Inside Radio. And my name is Shofu Babalolati of Lost. Till I see you again. Do have